Good evening. We may, might make a start. Um, my name's Maureen Sullivan and I'm filling in for um, Linda O'Brien. So I'm not actually Linda O'Brien, for those of you who know her. Um, Mrs Anne Robletta, Robletta Glenster, Griffith University Council. Mr Robert Tucker, Doctor of, the Griffith, of Griffith University. Ms Vicky Batten, Embracing 2018 Advisory Committee Member and CEO of the FSG Australia, which is Freedom, Social Justice and Growth. Friends of the Library members, colleagues and guests. Welcome to this special Griffith University Friends of the Library presentation, Embracing the Gold Coast 2018 Commonwealth Games Legacy. I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we are, stand, we are meeting and pay my respects to the Elders, past and present, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. From the 4th to the 15th of April 2018, the 21st Commonwealth Games will be held on the Gold Coast. Over 11 days, of competition, 6,600 competitors and team officials from 70 nations and territories will participate in 18 sports, including the para sports. However, the Gold Coast 2018 Commonwealth Games is about much more than providing the best competition for athletes and the best event for spectators. It is about continuing to build the Gold Coast into a vibrant economic hub and contributing to a more prosperous, healthy and cohesive community. The Gold Coast 2018 is also a national milestone. It's the first Commonwealth Games to be hosted by a regional city in Australia. Long after the excitement of Gold Coast 2018 has passed, its success will be judged by the legacy it leaves for our future. Tonight, our expert panel will present an update of the city's 2018 Commonwealth Games and the significant piece of legacy to be delivered through the 200 hectare, hectare Gold Coast Health and Knowledge Precinct, which incorporates Griffith University, Gold Coast University and private hospitals and the Commonwealth Games Village. Our first presenter this evening is Brian Case, Manager, Project Services, Economic Development and Major Projects, City of Gold Coast. Brian has nearly six, 60, sorry Brian, 30 years experience. <laughs> he really isn't that old. In local government across a range of disciplines including town planning, design and project feasibility and partnerships. He currently works for the City of Gold Coast Economic Development and Major Projects Directorate, where he holds the position of Manager Project Services. Most recently, Brian has held senior management roles in partnership projects for the city, including the SEBA Super and the Metricon Stadium developments and the Gold Coast 2018 Commonwealth Games. So, welcome to Brian. Our second presenter this evening is Di Dixon, Project Director, Gold Coast Health and Knowledge Precinct. Di Dixon has worked in the areas of major infrastructure project management and economic development in both the UK and Australia over the past 15 years. She is currently managing the program of economic development activities and projects within the Gold Coast City Council's Economic Development and Major Projects Directorate. That's a mouthful. Um, which involves the development and promotion of clustering of related businesses and industry sectors and ensuring the city is globally competitive in availability, coverage, cost and capability of telecommunications infrastructure and in the uptake and adoption of the resulting technologies. Um, at the conclusion of Brian and Dyer's presentation, Duncan Free, um, OAM will join the panel to give his perspective on the sporting legacy impact to the region. Olympic rower Duncan Free is widely regarded as the most complete rower in the Australian squad's recent history. He launched his rowing career in 1991, winning a silver medal at the Junior World Rowing Titles in the single skull. In 1994, Duncan made his debut in the Australian senior team in the quad skull, and he won his first Olympic medal, a bronze medal, at the 1996 Atlantic, Atlanta Olympics. Duncan continued to compete internationally, picking up at world championship medals in both quad and double skulls. 
In 2016, Duncan joined forces with former Awesome Foursome member Drew Jin to row in the pair's event. The pair were voted International Crew of the Year after winning back-to-back -back gold medals at the 2006 and 2007 World Rowing Championships. And Duncan went on to win a gold medal at the 2008 Beijing Olympic Games. Current, uh, Duncan is currently a director of the Griffith Sports College. So there will be opportunities for questions at the conclusion of the presentations, but I will ask Brian and Di to come up and speak. So um, Brian's going first, and he's going to focus on Commonwealth Games venues and the city legacy impact. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. It's wonderful to be here. Um, I've actually spent a full day um, with some amazing students from Griffith Uni, one floor down in a, in a workshop with Cisco Systems and um, some of your academic team. Um, Wow, there's some bright students in this this uh, campus and it, it all goes well for the future of the Gold Coast if we can get them great jobs here. And I guess that's what legacy is all about. Um, but before I start, um, a lot of people don't really understand the scale and scope of the Commonwealth Games, so I just thought I'd, I'd give you some very quick fast facts. We all know it's in early April 2018. It will be the largest sporting event held in Australia for, for a decade. Um, there'll be 6,500 athletes and officials, a uh, global audience of more than 1.5 billion. I suspect it'll be more than that because the way we're moving with the internet, anyone who has access to the internet and is in one of those 70 countries will probably um, watch it through streaming. Uh, $2.3 billion is our games budget, but the spend is bigger than that, and I'll talk about that. Um, 18 sports, so the first Commonwealth Games to have 18 sports and the first Commonwealth Games to introduce beach volleyball, which is a great outcome for the city. Uh, and we'll be hosting 70 nations and territories from across the Commonwealth. Uh, what is legacy? Uh, not an easy question, uh, not an easy answer to that question and I struggled with it back in November 2009 uh, when I was doing pre-feasibility work for the Commonwealth Games. I've got two examples there, the first one from the, uh, a gentleman at the University of Lucerne. It's quite a long definition. Um, I like the last line of his. Legacy essentially is a dream to be pursued rather than a certainty to be achieved. And I, I think we should just park that for the moment. I, I think that's, that's really nice. And Norman Brook, uh, a sports consultant, his is quite simple um, and direct. There's no right answer to the definition of legacy and everyone will have their own opinion or view on it, and I hope you do, um, because that means that we have different outcomes and different solutions. Um, but it's important that we have a view about what legacy is. Um, this is mine. Legacy is the return on our games investment um, in projects, programs or initiatives uh, that we aspire to achieve, to be measured at any point in time. So we're already realising legacy, and I had a conversation outside before this uh, started and we we're talking about the legacies that are being achieved already at the Gold Coast Aquatic Centre. Um, it can be a short term or long term legacy, positive or negative and we've got to remember if you do things wrong there's negative legacies and um, unfortunately Delhi as a host city probably suffered from that uh, in hosting the Commonwealth Games. Uh, it can be financial and non-financial so um, we shouldn't always put a cost uh, on our cost benefit analysis in dollar terms uh, and it's measured, ideally measured quantitatively or qualitatively. So this is my view on what are the key elements of legacy planning, uh, the dream. So these are the aspirations that we should set, our, uh, should set ourselves. The alignment, so there's games partners, so it's not just the City of Gold Coast, the State Government, there's community groups. There's the CGAs, the Commonwealth Games Federation themselves. Um, but the city also has strategies. So we have about six key strategies that we're trying to deliver over the next 20 years. There's about another 60 strategies and policies and programs that sit underneath those. So we should be trying to align the games investment towards those strategies. Um, we're investing in things. I'm gonna talk about that a little bit later. So this is the investment in, in um, infrastructure. 
It's what we do with those things that are important. And we should be able to um, measure or realise the impacts. And we should be able to uh, acknowledge and share the outcomes. You'll see some traffic lights down the left-hand side. Um, I think we've got our aspirations right. I think we've got our alignments right. Um, we're certainly spending money on things pretty rapidly. Um, we're expanding our views on what we should be doing with the things we're investing on. Uh, we're starting to measure the impacts or the realisation um, of the legacy. We're yet to acknowledge and share those outcomes with the community. And I think we'll probably start doing that um, with about a year to go. So the City of Gold Coast, there's, there's more than one partner, as I said before. There's four or five key partners in the delivery of the Games. But the City of Gold Coast, as an organisation, has set itself two legacy aspirations that underpin the Games investment. One is the city reputation. So this is about telling the new story of the Gold Coast, the transformation um, of the Gold Coast into a world-class boutique city, and it's underpinned, or ideally should be underpinned by a diversified economy. And part of our biggest legacy in the Health and Knowledge Precinct, Guy's going to expand on later. Uh, incredibly important for the city that we become a smart city and that we become one rapidly. The second one is about the people, the city pride, we want a city of engaged citizens. So we want to turn our residents into citizens. We want them to participate, um, be proud of their city, get out there, advocate for the city, um, bring friends along, send their friends home to advocate about how great the city is. Um, what we do have with the Commonwealth Games is a flexible deadline. So George Black, who was the CEO of the Gold Coast City, said for him the best things about the Games is that it has a fixed deadline. There's no ability to postpone. Uh, what that's meant is that the government's had to think fairly carefully about projects that, are, it's, that have been sitting in the pipeline for a while. Um, these are projects that have been on people's minds but perhaps not in their hands. And the Games brings an urgency to delivery of projects. So Bundle Road, Upgrade. It's been planned for a long, long time. It's just been sitting there, sitting there, waiting for funding, not happening. Uh, the heavy to light rail, that project's probably been brought forward by five years. And the duplication of the heavy rail, we've been trying to do that for 15, well, since the heavy rail was put in, so 15 years. So the Commonwealth Games has been the catalyst to take projects from people's minds and put them in their hands. Now, these aren't games-funded projects, so technically they don't sit under the games fund. They sit under the portfolios that would normally deliver these. But the games has been the, the catalyst to get those departments to act on these long-term projects and bring significant change to the city. When you start combining those three things together, it has a significant impact on how people move around our city. It's all happening at once. Um, so there's two types of investment I'd like to talk about. There's the infrastructure projects and programs and operations, and that's the 2.3 billion. There's the indirect investment, and that's some public-private partnerships. So our friends, Grocon across the road, uh, and their um, investment partners uh, are providing significant funding into the development of the Games Village. And then there's the bring forward of the Commonwealth Games project, uh, government projects, which I talked about before. So principally, the investment funding is in sports, transport and public domain, uh, and the private sector stuff is Games Village and Studio Village, uh, sorry, um, Village Roadshows, uh, Film Studio 9. Does anyone know about that project? Seen it in the paper? Okay, might try and talk about that. So sports, the sports infrastructure. Anyone been up to Cooma recently? So this is the new Cooma Indoor Sports Centre. It was opened in August, uh, $39.8 million of work. Uh, it'll host the gymnastics and netball at games time. Originally, this was meant to be a temporary structure um, sitting in the Southport Border Parklands. Through some um, commitment from our games partners and good value engineering, we've ended up with a fairly first class um, facility in the northern end of the Gold Coast. Uh, the northern end of the Gold Coast has a, a demographic that's um, higher 
in children under 15 than anywhere else on the Gold Coast. Uh, it's a growing community. They don't have many good sports facilities, as you'd expect in a new community. This indoor venue will be very, very popular and is already proving very, very popular with that young community. Um, in legacy mode, it'll seat 350, um, but it has the capacity to bump in uh, over 7,000 seats. So at games time, it'll be one of our biggest ticketed venues. Uh, and because of those uh, seating arrangements, it's probably the highest indoor venue of its size in the country. And that gives us a lot of flexibility for a whole range of events. Certainly great for rhythmic and jet gymnastics, which you couldn't do in most indoor venues. Just don't have the height. Beautiful venue. Gold Coast Sports Precinct. So those two big yellow boxes. Um, pretty impressive. Has anyone been past them recently? What do you think? Is it making a statement? No? You don't like it? They are yellow boxes. Um, yeah, you don't like them? Sorry? I missed that. So do you know Metricon Stadium? So park next door to Metricon Stadium. Um, they cost $101 million. It's one venue, but it's made up of two big boxes and connected by a main street, if you like. Um, we, that, that, that venue, um, I suspect, will be booked out nearly every day. Uh, the court space in that is amazing. Um, I, I've, I've been involved in this precinct for a long, long time. This, oh, doesn't work. this facility here um, is well past its design life. Um, we can't host major events. What you see next door is an opportunity to put um, Gold Coast sport back on the map in, in, in indoor sports. And we've already attracted um, an international event, the Suderman Cup, which is the World Badminton Championships to this venue in 2017. Uh, it'll host um, basically 5,000 seats in, in each venue at games time. Gold Coast Aquatic Centre. Does everyone know where that one is? <laughs> so this is one of the brought forward projects in the Commonwealth Games um, delivery program. Uh, $41 million was spent on uh, redeveloping this venue. Um, it has a new 50 metre competition pool, a refurb 25 metre pool, a dive pool, new drive facilities, uh, three gymnasiums on site. Uh, it has a cafe and it doesn't have a roof, and there's good reason for that. Um, to put a roof on this facility to host the Commonwealth Games, we'd have an eight-storey building, and it would be a big box, bigger than that box you see at Carrara, and that's not appropriate for the Southport Broader Parklands. This is a pool that sits within the parklands, and um, it has visibility in and out. And to host an event with 10,000 seats, we might get that twice in four or five years. We'd have the maintenance, um, which would be a couple of million dollars a year of a facility like that. And I think architecturally, to your point, that's a much better solution than the big box solution. But the big box solution has a particular function and in that location it's appropriate. You'll see that. There'll be some sculptural and, and uh, landscape elements, but you can't hide a big box, and our budget isn't $200 million. Uh, the community have really embraced this facility since it's been built. Um, we had about 150,000 visitors to the, to the old Gold Coast pool uh, since this has opened. Uh, this year, we've achieved 350,000 visits to that pool. So not quite triple, but I suspect at some point we'll get close to tripling the patronage of the, of the previous pool. It's attracted international events, international teams. Um, it's, it's just a nice place to be. And those 350,000 visits are turning our Gold Coast residents into happy, healthy people. OK. 
can't get a better investment than that. Um, but it's not all about sporting venues. Um, in this case, it's providing opportunities for sporting venues. So this is just north of, of the aquatic centre. Uh, this is predominantly reclaimed land. So three and a half hectares of reclaimed land. Um, that sand actually came from built up sand in the navigational channels. So we've, we've, we've provided navigational outcomes, we've provided boating infrastructure, and we've provided community infrastructure here in this new building, and this great big open space. That open space will be filled with temporary venues at games time, and it will host triathlon and the marathon. But post games, or before and after games, we have this great piece of park infrastructure. Um, if you're a boater, you've probably been there. You've used it? It's good? Yep. Gold Coast has about 25,000 registered boats. So it's a lot of boat users and they're crying out for good boating facilities. And this is a collaborative project with the State Government Department of Transport and Main Roads. Public art. Um, the city adopted a public art plan in July. Um, and these are some of the first pieces of public art that will emerge under that plan. Um, but there's also other projects that will be wrapping, um, or there'll be an announcement, or entries will be open early next year to, to wrap some of our trams in public art. Uh, and uh, council, just recently at the last council meeting, um, has put funding aside for some gateway art, so entry points into the city with really substantial gateway art. It's important. Um, art subjective, so some people will like this, others won't, but it's, important, it's an important additional dimension to the city. Stage nine, so um, Village Roadshow are hosting a number of Commonwealth sports. They have big boxes out there, they're perfect for temporary overlay. It's a cheap solution for, for Goldock. Uh, it allowed us, in part, to deliver that Coomera facility with the savings of moving into already existing facilities. Um, this particular sound stage um, it, it is a legacy opportunity that came about because people were talking. So Lynn Benzies, who runs Village Roadshow, when she heard we were building those two big boxes, she wanted to use them for filming. Um, and she, she was prepared to pay fairly uh, attractive rent to the city to use those two big boxes. When I asked her how long she would want to use those two big boxes for a movie, she said, not long, probably three to six months. So it's three to six months the community couldn't use those facilities, so it wasn't a solution. But the idea that they needed a big box to attract more films to the city was parked in a few minds. We were going to build temporary squash facilities at Runaway Bay. It was going to cost about $11 million. Um, <coughs> We were already having some sports out at um, Village Roadshow. So we entered into a discussion with Village Roadshow executives and said, wouldn't it be a great idea if we moved government funding into this permanent facility and you made up the difference? So government put in 11, Village Roadshow put in five. It was finished last May. It's a massive building. And within four weeks, four was being filmed there. That's a $100 million movie, so it's $100 million injected in principally into the Gold Coast economy, employing about 700 people. So that's a fairly simple structure. It probably has a design life for 40 years. If we get two movies every three years that are blockbusters, that's a $2.8 billion impact. I don't know how many jobs that is over 40 years because my mass is not that good, but it's thousands and thousands of jobs over a long period, so that's enduring legacy for the investment or the government investment of only $11 million. Uh, the last one's the Commonwealth Games Village. Um, pretty spectacular. Uh, the scaffolding's about to come down. At the moment, there's about 1,300 workers on site, predominantly uh, Gold Coast workers. Um, Gold Coast companies have picked up about over 50% of the contracts that have been laid on that site and about $190 million directly into Gold Coast companies. 
It's a much bigger project than that. It's probably about a $380 million build. Um, Goldock will spend about $100 million doing games, village operations and overlay. They'll serve 20 to 7,000 meals a day at that venue. They'll have a workforce of about um, 1,400 during games time. Um, this project has been uh, delivered in a very quick time frame and importantly, there was a number of um, other tenderers, if you like, uh, who had all sorts of different models. This is the only one that had a concentrated, um, fairly dense solution. And what that meant was all this vacant land that you see in and around in a post-games environment is available for development. It's available for health and knowledge precinct, those knowledge jobs that we so desperately need. And Di's going to talk about how many of those she's going to deliver. But the Commonwealth Games Village has actually delivered the road network the water, the sewerage, the broadband, the telecommunications, uh, a regional stormwater solution, so it services this uni, the hospital, all of, all of the, the, the surrounding Smith Street stormwater issues which we've had for a long, long time. Um, a fantastic regional park for, for the broader area and a pretty exciting mixed use street which will run down through here and connect back up into the light rail station. And I suspect that this hub here on this main street will, will become the social centre of this, this precinct. And if we think of this precinct and we add the workers in, we add the people that live here and we add the students, we're talking about 50,000 people. That's a pretty, that's a lot of people all in a fairly tight space. I suspect if Di gets her job right, which I'm sure she will, this will be one of the most exciting places on the Gold Coast. Uh, and because of the jobs that it delivers, um, we think this is the biggest legacy for the Gold Coast from the Commonwealth Games. And if you think about World Expo in Brisbane in 1988, and for those that are old enough like me, didn't want it to stop, but the legacy of that is South Bank. And it's still, it's still going, it's still enduring, there's still development and there's still jobs going on 30 years later. Um, Di's going to deliver this in a much, much shorter time than that. But that's the impact that an event can have. So it's not just about infrastructure, it's also about programs. So we've got an arts and culture program um, that dovetails nicely into our arts and culture strategy. We've got a food waste recycling trial, we've got a visitor servicing program, we've got a Be My Guest program, a high performance sport attraction, I'll talk about that a little bit. We've got a business trade and investment program. Um, we're trying to change the travel behaviour of people on the Gold Coast. We've got a program about that. We want to get people out of cars and onto public transport. Um, the Commonwealth Games may be the first time that people on the Gold Coast have actually caught public transport. I know that sounds hard to believe, but it's true. And if we can provide a good service at Games time, then perhaps they'll start thinking a little bit more um, about changing their behaviours and, and helping reduce um, congestion on our roads. But also, maybe they'll walk or catch um, a shared ride service or ride a bike and we're investing in an extra bikeway infrastructure. Um, Gold Coast Media Centre. So I have a program there. Um, Gold Dock are responsible for looking after the world's sporting media and there's about 3,000 of those at games time and they'll be housed in the Gold Coast uh, Exhibition and Convention Centre. But there's always a lot of other media that comes to town around an event like this. We estimate there's going to be about 1,500 non-accredited media. And this is the sort of media that likes to tell stories about people and places. So the city's uh, investing several million dollars in developing um, a Gold Coast Media Centre. So this will be a structure um, on the beach at Karawa, right on the foreshore. Um, and we'll have a program of stories and locations. And I was just talking to Mark Manor out the front about, you know, what sort of good stories can we take that promotes the Gold Coast as, an, as a leader, a, a global leader, in some of the things that, that we can do and are doing or should do? And we, we were focusing our discussion around services to the disability and homeless. But there's a broad range of stories that we need to start capturing and putting into that centre. And film attraction. So the city always uh, has, for a long time, had a film attraction program and that program has been ramped up um, in and around the games time. 
Um, and I guess what that means for us is we shouldn't look at the project, so we shouldn't look at the big box, the thing, whether you like it or not. Um, we should think about what we do with the thing. So um, if we clip a project and a program together, then we get real impact and we get real legacy. I'll, I'll give you two examples. We're just going to use two case studies tonight. It's new sports venues and high performance sport attraction. Um, so the dream or our aspiration for uh, high performance sport is to attract high performance sporting events, attract national sporting organisations, and I can't remember the other two off the top of my head so I'll have to check my cheat notes. Um, increase the city's reputation as a global sports city and increase the number of high performance um, teams in the city. Now, before I talked about realisation, so we're investing in these, this infrastructure. We have a, a high performance uh, attraction program, so there's money going into that. Um, are we doing our job? So we've secured the Suderman Cup as an event. It's a ten, it'll have a $10 million impact on, on the city. So these are the sort of benefits that we have to be able to articulate so that we can talk to the community. And the Sorry. See what happens when you talk about a project for so long, you just think everyone else knows about it. So the Suderman Cup is the World Badminton Team Championships. It's, it's, a, it's a big event for badminton and it's uh, one of those high participant events. So lots of teams, lots of people coming to the coast and that's why the impact's so big. The ITU World Triathlon, that's a $16 million impact. Uh, the 2020 World Bowls Championships, $8.5 million. The Australian Open Lawns Bowls, uh, that's over five years uh, at, at $6 million a year. So in a very short time, um, since our venues, we've been able to share our venues with the world, um, we've secured a number of international events with some pretty impressive um, local impa uh, impacts on the local economy. National sporting organisations. So if we're going to be known for a, a, a sporting city, we have to have national sporting uh, organisations here. Um, so the, the uh, Federation of International Basketball's uh, Oceana headquarters are now located on the Gold Coast, as are Mountain Biking Australia, Triathlon Australia this year. Um, BMX Australia will, will move their high performance and national headquarters to the Gold Coast in a, a new facility that they're building at Reedy Creek in conjunction with Council. Uh, and Squash Australia are moving here in 2017 and we continue to go out there and. Um, I'm sure if we had better rowing facilities, we'd get Rowing Australia here too. But, uh, you know, our program is to keep pushing the city's credentials in that space. Um, so, uh, Sports Business put out an Ultimate Sports Business Award. It's, it's one of those um, uh, benchmarks that international cities that play in the sports space look to. We've never, we've never been on this list before. Um, we came in this year for the first time, uh, number 15 on the list, uh, and we also got the Best Newcomer Award. Now, some pretty impressive cities in there. London dropped off the number one list for the first time. New York is now the number one sports city in the world. Uh, we have an aspiration to be in the top 10 by 2018. That might seem fanciful. Glasgow, who aren't a very big city in, in world terms, they sit at number five and the Commonwealth Games pushed them right up the list. And they're still sitting high up on that list. So it's all well and good to get in the top of the list, but it's keeping your name on the list. So you have to have a program that keeps going past the Games to keep us up. And then the high performance teams that come to the city to train. So we wanted 16 teams by 2018. That was our target. Uh, we had 13 teams in 2014. In 2015, after it was well known that we were hosting the Commonwealth Games, we had 27 teams come to the city, and so far this year it's 15. I think we might end up at about 17. Um, that's probably a little lower than we'd expected, but understandable given that the Olympics were on and um, national teams have fairly long forecasts about their training programs uh, coming into an Olympics. And not all our venues are finished yet either. Uh, this is the other one, and, and um, I talked about this before, but I'm not going to talk about um, some of the realisation because that would be stealing dice thunder. But that's the Commonwealth Games village uh, as of yesterday. So we want to go from this to that. 
So that's our legacy. So let's just go back again. So all this vacant land that we talked about here. We want to put people, impressive people in impressive buildings doing impressive things. And where, where we are right now, if we were to look across the road, ideally that would be the legacy of the Commonwealth Games Village. So the shorter term leg legacy outcomes for the village, it's employing a lot of people right now, there's a lot of money going into the local economy before it, they're doing some very clever things in the sustainability space, um, they're providing lots of uh, skills and job training, but that all ends when they leave the site. This, this is the real game. Uh, there's 498 days to go to the Games. Uh, I hope you all buy tickets. I hope you all get tickets. And I'd love to see you there. And please, go. if you get a ticket, go to the big yellow boxes that you don't like and you'll see how fantastic they are and how they operate. Thank you. opportunity for, for um, questions at the end, but we might just move on to Di now. So Di's going to um, tell us about the impact for the region from a community and economic perspective. Um, it's fascinating. So welcome Di. Uh, well, good evening everyone and thank you for the opportunity to come and share my passion for this project with you all. I'll try and contain that to the 10 minutes I've been given, um, but I could talk about this project for a lot longer. Um, so happy to take questions or speak to anyone after this event as well today. Um, as Brian mentioned, in terms of legacy, um, there's a lot of projects that have been planned by the city especially that have been in the planning stages for, for many years and this project really provides a, quite a special example of a project that's been around since 2001 and that the Games has provided a real catalyst to actually bringing it all together along with a, a range of other um, investments into infrastructure within the precinct as well. But really the Games Village location within the precinct really changed everything and really fast-tracked the ability for part the partners to all come together. And that's what's really unique about this precinct in that it is a unique precinct partnership. You can see everyone listed there who's already here and those white buildings in the land that Brian's already outlined in terms of the 9.5 hectares that will remain after the Games that is what I'm focused on in terms of making sure we get the right investment, the right activity, the right business and industry and the right jobs to come into the city to really create something quite global globally unique. In terms of the investment to date, um, so it's not just about the game's legacy, but it's about an alignment of the planets over many years now, um, since the project was first um, instigated in back in 2001, as I mentioned. Um, and as you can see there, there's been a significant amount of investment with over $5 billion over the last decade by the partners and other levels of government. And that's also included things like road upgrades and the light rail especially, which has given this whole precinct its connectivity to the rest of the coast at the moment. But then, again, as an impact of the legacy of the Games, um, the linkage to main rail and heavy rail um, at Helensvale as part of the Games um, program leading up to that for transportation. As well as that, you can already see that it's a significant employer here in the precinct. The partners themselves are already providing a lot of employment opportunities, but it's how we make that, um, um, how we really leverage that going forward. So the precinct itself has the capacity to create over 12,500 new unique high-end jobs if we get it right. And that's really where, uh, in terms of economic impact of a legacy project such as this in, and its linkages to, to the value of the Commonwealth Games and the, the highlight and the commitment that's then instigated from many partners can be outlined here. Um, that, it, that investment into infrastructure from all three levels of government um, has really created the right conditions to create special high-end jobs. So looking at the whole crux of the City Council's um, economic development strategy, and that's a long-term strategy that's been focused on diversifying the economy to move away from our pillars of construction, um, retail and tourism, and really look at what are the jobs of the future. Um, so pr by providing innovation um, infrastructure, you can really drive innovation, and that's where we've created the, the right environment here if we can then attract the right subsequent investment into it. So in terms of the, the build out of the whole precinct post games, once that is complete, there's the opportunity for a, an impact on the gross regional product of um, just over $2.9 billion. 
And in terms of land use productivity, that's quite a significant factor with economic outcomes in terms of driving the correct use of land and really making sure you create what they call economic agglomeration through the clustering of businesses and the driving of jobs and value of that land. So not only are we providing um, the increased activity here in the precinct, but it's actually increasing the value of the land and the value of the outputs that you actually get from that land. And as you can see there, it's been um, determined by the economic analysis work we've had undertaken by Ernst & Young that there's potential for over $120 million of net economic benefits which could be realised should we get it right and the full build out of the precinct. And one of the main um, factors of the, the Gold Coast Economic Development Strategy as well is a focus on productivity. We are actually um, a, a not a high achiever in that area and it's something that the city's been focused on through its economic development area um, in terms of increasing that and raising the levels of wages within the city and creating pathways. So not only can you come here to study, have a great lifestyle, but you can stay here and have a high quality job or a pathway through to high quality jobs. And um, if, on precinct completion that we've actually um, an analysed that we could increase productivity here in the city by um, just over 1.8%. In terms of my role here, and that's again um, been created by the unique commitment by the precinct partners, it was actually the Griffith University, Gold Coast Health and the City of Gold Coast who all came together um, just over two years ago and determined that if we were really serious about leveraging this lead up to the games um, and making sure that we were all focused on who we wanted to come into the precinct and drive the need for the greenfield land to be used in the most effective way and not just be lost for other commercial activity or for additional residential as we see so, so often across the coast. The, those partners all came together to joint fund um, the resource which is the project office which I head up in terms of focusing on what investment we want. The land itself is owned, is owned by Queensland government so they are obviously a, a core partner as well. Uh, so our role is working on the demand side is one way to look at it and supply the um, demand for the, the land purchase and the correct land use to go back to that land productivity value. So the, the partners are, were very keen to make sure we had a clear vision and strategy and those points um, in the top right hand corner there really outline where everyone was at about two, just over two years ago and one of those as you can see is about maximising the legacy of the games and making sure we try and, and leverage that as much as possible. So the precinct delivery office itself is focused on driving those activities. So the first year of my role was really about being embedded within the university and the hospitals, um, really getting down to where those niche areas of academic research and clinical expertise lie. There's many, many health and knowledge precincts globally, and so it's really about creating what our special niche is um, and then targeting in on that. And my role is about then linking that to a global business company or investor who would then be able to gain some commercial value from having a partnership to be located in such close proximity to the types of work that we've been able to identify. So that's been both through um, supply chain opportunities, so suppliers particularly to the hospitals and to the university um, who are spending millions of dollars with companies every year. So why not be smarter about how we spend that money and actually create strategic long-term partnerships with those global companies and not just see them as service providers and actually get them to come and locate here in the city to become a, a key employer as well alongside them. We've had to be very clear as well, um, while not overstepping the mark in terms of not being the landowners, but working very closely with Queensland Government in that respect, but making sure we determine not only who we want in the precinct, but being very clear on who we don't want in the precinct. Um, and so a range of precinct occupant criteria have been devised, um, that's the high level um, headlines there, but it's predominantly around, as I just mentioned, having that clear linkage to things that we actually have um, going on in the precinct or emerging as key core academic or clinical skills um, and having companies that are really going to be able to leverage that and build up um, employment around having that exposure and close proximity, but also having that global reach um, as well and that ability for export potential and selling our services um, and intellectual property globally. It is also, of course, as I keep mentioning, it's all about the jobs. Um, 
jobs and growth. Um, and so in terms of building those, those full-time employment areas that are, are jobs of value that are going to help us diversify the economy. But we also make, need to make sure we're working with partners that can actually co-invest. They're not looking to come in uh, and have a free ride at all. There are a range of incentives, which I'll touch on in a moment, available to interested parties. But it's about being commercially viable. And that's very much where when I go in and have pitches with various global companies, we have to have a credible reason why they would want to come here and be here and that has to be very articulate um, and, and to the point and has to have benefits for both sides obviously. Uh, and when I talked about things that we don't want in the precinct, it's not necessarily that they're, they're bad for the region, it's just that they could be elsewhere. So particularly our close proximity to the CBD um, and making sure that we're, we're not just focusing on what could come here. So a lot of professional type services and other businesses um, I may have been approached by or, or had conversations with and we've actually redirected them to elsewhere in the city and the same has occurred particularly for the Yatla Enterprise area in terms of larger scale industry um, as well. So it's about being um, complementary to the rest of the city. We are a linear city and we have to. We have a lot of clustering of other business activities. So it's making sure, again, that we stay true to what has value to be here. And the first question I'm asked by my board, who I report through to, is, well, why here and not elsewhere in the city? And we have to have a clear answer to that. Um, so as I've touched on, um, the role of the precinct delivery office is very much about implementing an investment attraction strategy. So we have, have a very clear strategy about what those niche opportunities are, which I'll touch on in a moment. And then also who those global partners could be and then having a proactive approach in terms of going out there, um, whether it's on our own or whether it's as part of a conference or in alignment with work that particularly the university may be doing internationally. Um, and that's where those uh, conversations, particularly at a university, and a hospital level have been critical um, and where my role has been um, empowered by having that access to, to the relationships and being able to have doors opened globally to companies that have got a very strong relationship already with someone within the precinct and being able to then use that relationship to talk about what some of those opportunities for that company may well be. A lot of it also has been around having conversations like this um, at, at national and international events where we can promote the city, what's going on here and what this unique opportunity could be. Um, a lot of the opportunities we may not even have thought of yet, um, which is another reason to stay very clear on s maintaining the land. This could be a, a 15, 30 year project if we were to stay true to what we actually want to achieve um, out of it. Hopefully it happens a lot quicker. Um, but that's also involved a lot of conversations with developers and partners. So we're introducing a lot of companies to potential um, Gold Coast and Queensland um, companies who th they can then work with for potential development. And an example of that is um, hopefully we will have a pre-games building that will occur because of the work that we've been undertaking um, and have identified a significant tenant and a developer who have now come together and actually um, go are going through the, the land um, development purchase process with the Queensland Government at the moment. In terms of the uh, global unique opportunity, um, a lot of these things are said by many uh, precincts globally. Uh, so as I was going to say, it's about having that credible reason. So yes, we do have an amazing lifestyle. We are a gateway to the Asia Pacific, but we also need, really need to stress, communicate and profile the amazing work that's already going on in the precinct and the emerging skills um, that are occurring. But the quite uniqueness is around that infrastructure, the connectivity that we have here, the close proximity that we actually have between the partners and then the greenfield land that will be available um, uh, and also a highly skilled workforce which um, is obviously an emerging area for the city but that access to reliable staff particularly uh, for the Asian market is, is particularly critical. Uh, and as I mentioned, we're, we're fortunate as well to have a range of incentives. The city of Gold Coast is, was the first local government um, about six years ago to introduce financial incentives to attract investment into the city. Um, there are a couple of other national um, local governments that uh, have followed suit with that. But we So we offer direct financial assistance to companies depending on the job numbers created, the amount of investment um, they're putting in, uh, whether they're bringing particular R&D and what level of R&D, and also whether... Uh, the level of activity, whether it's a significant head office or satellite um, office structure for them. 
that's just a slide I use, which I have alluded to already, around that the whole role is critical on those relationships. Everything that we're doing is about being out, talking to people, learning who everyone else is talking to and using that network of relationships. And the Gold Coast is quite phenomenal in that amount of um, global networks that people just don't realise the value of. Um, in terms of some priority projects, I won't go through them in detail, we don't have time tonight, but um, there's just some listed there that were ones that were actually undertaking and driving on behalf of the precinct partners, so on behalf of Griffith University, we're driving the Advanced Design and Manufacturing Institute concept, which will hopefully be a Griffith-funded capital building uh, that will be one of the first buildings over the road. Uh, access to the land will be post-games, obviously, um, from January 2019, so that'll be one of the, the first buildings that will put in place. So we're doing a lot of work at the moment in terms of market engagement for regional companies who will be able to use such a facility in terms of 3D printing and additive manufacturing, um, but also companies that globally that would like to come and partner, either be a tenant within such a facility or located close by. Institute for Glycomics obviously is, is a globally credible um, institute here at Griffith and has been an amazing uh, partner for us. We've been travelling globally with them and had a range of doors opened in terms of the work that they're doing and being able to leverage that with companies that have an interest to be able to actually be located to their sort of activities. And something that's emerged over the last 18 months is around the creation of an Asia-Pacific medical training hub. A lot of the larger companies in the health sector that I was having discussions with were less inclined to, to do um, straight R&D facilities, but on further discussion, we saw that maybe leveraging the medical tourism aspect of the city, the attractiveness that people do want to come here, and really leveraging that, and there's a lot of interest from some of the main companies in creating headquarters here in terms of showcasing their equipment, being able to fly in, all of their Asia-Pacific based staff for training and have access also to a clinical environment um, with the hospitals in terms of how that equipment could be used. This is just a, an overview um, from our investment attraction strategy, which just really um, has the headline targets in terms of sector breakdown of where we've seen some opportunities and uh, some com commercial and investment opportunities in terms of the work that's going on between the partners and also emerging work uh, that, that's starting to come out that it has um, commercial value and commercial interest. And probably can't uh, miss out that last box on the bottom as well in terms of creating that activity space. Um, and the precinct is very much, we don't want to create um, a, a typical technology park with the land that's available. We want it to be fully integrated. So we want it to be a totally active centre, so street level, very much pushing for cafes, restaurants, really trying to pull the partners into a central location, as Brian mentioned as well, in terms of the opportunities, rather than having ending up with a situation where we have a university a hospital, private hospital, and then a technology park. It's about how we make sure that's all integrated together. Um, just to break that down slightly more, um, this just shows a list of, so each of those dot points has a global company that we're actively talking to at the moment in terms of their interest in the precinct and their linkages through the work that's going on in the university and the, the two hospitals. Um, so um, without giving any away, that's really just to... to, to give um, an, an understanding in terms of the level of interest. I'd, I'd like to say it's all been around targeting, but there has been a lot of people approach us just with word getting out in terms of the opportunities. And again, that's where the, the exposure through the Commonwealth Games is really providing us with that opportunity and with it being seen as the, the most significant part of legacy being delivered, it, it's gradually getting more um, exposure and will be part of a significant trade and investment program being led by the state government. Uh, just to give a bit of a further detail on, on the slides that Brian had shown there, so that's the overview of the uh, Parklands Priority Development Area, which is the 29 hectares that's going to be used for the Commonwealth Games. So the pink buildings there are the residential that you saw on the, the former slide. Um, the orange area is land that's available, but that um, will be used by Queensland Health. And then you see the private hospital at the front there. And then within that dotted um, black line is the 9.5 hectares. So the two red um, dash buildings are buildings that will be left after the games. So they're seen as interim buildings with a, a lifespan of about 10 years. Um, so we're, we're looking at those uses now in terms of potential co-working space, incubator space, or those sort of um, activities that lend themselves to 
to, they're both one to two story buildings and won't be there forever, but will actually create, um, create that activation that we're seeking and engagement from a range of um, players. The darker green area is where we're focusing on the, the, the probably there's about four key leads at the moment where we're at land transaction discussion stages. So really trying to create those first areas of development so that they're all in one space. So we get that critical mass. And again, as I think Brian mentioned, get that activity up that main street that leads up to the core of the, the residential component. Uh, there's just a few dot points there that uh, uh, Brian mentioned a few of those in terms of uh, the, the athlete's village itself. So this is where it really is a core component and adds a whole other element to a health and knowledge precinct that you're, we're going to be left with over 12,000 dwellings, a real strong, high-quality residential product, um, along with open parkland space um, within that location. In terms of the main... Um, Games legacy outcomes for the precinct, as I just mentioned, it's really to create that, that activity, be, being able to have that core within a precinct like this with the other partners, really gives us the opportunity for an integrated and connected environment, really gives us the opportunity to focus on what that greenfield land can be used for while we've got the attention of all the stakeholders and all levels of government, and really looking at how we can use it so we do create something um, quite special. Uh, and just to finish off, I have got a few uh, slides here which just expand on the ones that um, Brian showed um, in terms of the development of the residential um, and how quickly that's going up, um, which does give um, investors a lot of um, assurance in terms of this is real and we're not just using um, artists' impressions, um, although there's one for you, so that's what the um, Athletes' Village will look like. So yeah, so again, as Brian is, so that's there and that's yeah, the hopeful reality. Um, and this just gives you a real indication of the density of the whole precinct once fully built out and its position with the rest of the city and how critical things like light rail are as well in terms of its connectivity, particularly to the CBD. Uh, uh, and that's important, we, although we, I do use that terminology, a city in a city, it's about how it interrelates to the rest of the city and our uniqueness in that respect um, with all the other amazing things that, that go on here. And these are just some of the other artists' impressions in terms of what it could look like um, literally opposite where we are currently sat um, within the next decade, hopefully. And that's the one that Brian showed. And then just another angle there in terms of the fully built out um, potential. And there is a whole um, range of design principles around this. There's been a lot of work done by um, all levels of government in terms of making sure that what, what development we do get here is of a high quality and is of a, a usable nature and, and of a sustainable nature and, and not just that sort of boxed uh, approach to technology parks to, for want of a, a theme of the evening. Um, and so I just threw this slide in in terms of, of, of what you can do for the, for the precinct. And this is where really what it's all about, as, uh, as I mentioned, in terms of it's about spreading the word. Everyone in this room has connections, has networks, has people they know that may be working in large companies or may have ideas around what suppliers are missing in the city for the sort of activities we have going on here in the precinct or what sort of niche opportunities or research or activity they're aware of that's going on that may link through to a commercial um, player. So just wanted to leave some of those thoughts um, with you. Um, there is some more information just on the side over there if anyone wants a brochure. And as I mentioned, happy to, to talk to people uh, about the project at any time. So thank you very much for your time. Oh, that's so much information and so many things happening and it looks fantastic. Um, our last um, speaker tonight is Duncan and he's going to tell us about the sporting legacy that we're going to receive from the Commonwealth Games. No? No, we're going to go straight to the question time. Oh, that's not on my thing that you've told me because... <sighs> I don't know, it's hard to get good help. Um, so... What we're doing now is Duncan's going to lead us in a question and answer session. Um, so over to you. I guess I can start. And uh, they've all been very different in terms of, of legacy. And, and, you know, Atlanta was my first one. And that was a lot of, you know, they used the university for an Olympic, um, the, the village. Um, they used natural lakes for, you know, rowing and kayaking. And then, you know, four years down the track, you see Sydney. 
out at Homebush, a very different setup, um, quite removed from the city, uh, with purpose-built multi-million dollar rowing courses and things like that, which get heavily used. And I think Sydney did a pretty, pretty good job. Um, my only comment there is I think Homebush is a bit too far out of Sydney um, for Olympics. Then, you know, four years later, you see Athens, and that's probably the saddest out of the four that I went to. Um, you know, you see vision of you know, empty pools with grass growing through them, kind of, you know, grass rolling about, and they're, they're just not getting used at all. Um, so it was quite bad timing, unfortunately, for Athens. Um, and I remember, you know, being at the rowing course and there was, you know, government um, employees there trying to drum up business of getting high-performance teams, um, you know, back to Athens to, to train. And, you know, it just didn't quite work out for them. You know, Beijing, they did a pretty good job although they're turning the, the Rhine course into a water park at some stage. Um, so I'm not sure how that's going to turn out. But I think with the Gold Coast, it's a great opportunity, um, you know, f for a rapidly growing city. And, you know, you, you look at the Coomera um, facility up there, that northern corridor is the highest growth rate on the Gold Coast, if, if I'm right. And, uh, you know, with disengaged youths, and I think you said a stat of, of the highest number of, you know, 15... Yeah, yeah. And uh, so, you know, the facilities on the Gold Coast, you, I guess wise decisions have to be made when planning facilities. And I think it was very wise that the, the velodrome be in Brisbane um, because the velodrome on the Gold Coast may become a white elephant and not have the, the attraction of, of events. You know, the temporary fi facilities that, um, that are being made on the Gold Coast as well with studios and beach volleyball down south. So I think it's very important when, when hosting a, a Games that wise decisions are made in terms of what is in the city, what is permanent, what is temporary. And I think the Gold Coast has got it right um, from what I've seen and from what I'm hearing. And, uh, you know, it, it's really exciting um, to see. You know, we've got a great opportunity to... You know, when, when I think legacy, I think of a few things. We can get it right or we can get it wrong. Um, and so far, I think... We're planning to get it right. We can't say we've got it right because the games haven't even happened yet. But I think we are planning to get it right versus getting it wrong like Athens. And then you think about, you know, the participation of sport um, and of, you know, kids, adults. I've been up to Coomera facility and it gets used a lot. And I'm sure the, the boxes at Carrara will get used a lot as well. And I, I don't know of one facility that will not be you know, post-games, packed out with activity in one form or, or another. I think the, the Gold Coast was, you know, in dire need of, of those sorts of facilities. Uh, what are we, five, 600,000, you know, population now? And, uh, you know, we were lacking. But there's, you know, the participation, but there's also the, you know, which has been touched on as well, it adds value to the Gold Coast. You know, I've travelled the world, I've certainly travelled a lot around Australia in, in high-performance sport, and the Gold Coast has a lot to offer for training environments and for competitions. And, you know, to be a city that's attractive for anything in terms of events, whether it be, um, you know, World Championships or World Cups or, you know, various meets, or whether it be, you know, national sporting bodies come to the Gold Coast, whether it be high-performance camps from, you know, global, um, you know, sporting teams... I think we've, we're the city to do it in. I, I grew up here, I trained here, I, you know, lived here and uh, did all my sport here. The climate's right, the culture's right, we've got the beaches, we've got the, the, the hinterland and, you know, it's, it's, it's partnerships like this that um, can really open up doors for the Gold Coast, um, not only in sport but also within the, the precinct as well. So it's an exciting opportunity and one that could get wrong pretty easily but um, one that collectively together we can certainly get it right. I might just, just, just th those uh, sport venues didn't happen by chance. Um, in 2009, we started to look at what the future demographic profile of the Gold Coast be might be and its population. And we made conscious decisions to put venues in the right locations and not to accept all venues here. And the velodrome was a classic example um, from the city's point of view. Um, it was very concerned about how it might operate that venue um, and, and not wanting to pour million dollars or more into keeping a venue open that might not be sustainable and worse, not even used. Um, and there was a fair bit of debate about that, but when, when you started to lay out the facts, it became quite obvious that Brisbane was the right location for it. And I think the same would apply for the roof of the pool too.
I know there's a fair bit of debate about that, but when you start to look at the facts and it, it, um, it became quite obvious to us anyway internally that that wasn't the right decision. Questions? Um, there's a, uh, there's a um, microphone coming. Can you hear me? Good. Um, thank you very much for that. That all looks very exciting. I was just wondering, how do you incorporate all the principles of environmental sustainability and climate change adaptation into all your buildings and infrastructure? I'll have a go. There's, there's, there's two important sustainability um, messages here, I guess. One is that Goldock, as an event, um, is applying um, a, a world standard practice. There's an international um, standard for uh, sustainability and event management and not too many events, I have to say, have been able to achieve that and Goldock has. So from an event perspective, um, they've applied a, a very strict approach to sustainability from an operational point of view. From um, the venue delivery, um, it was important to the city, who incidentally is owning most of these um, venues when, when they've been built, uh, sustainability was important uh, and there's a range of initiatives across um, a lot of those venues. It's not just the venue itself, it's about providing public transport options to the venues. It's about um, key messaging that might come um, from making sustainability obvious in some of the venues. So if you take Metricon Stadium, for example, um, the solar panelling that sits around the edge of that, it's the solar producing clean energy back into the grid. Now, we could have put solar panels just on the back paddock or on the top of a roof like traditionally is done, but we wanted to make a statement that um, those solar panels can be part of a, a nice architectural solution. Um, the stormwater tanks aren't hidden behind um, the venue. They're actually right out, out the front, they have big gauges on them. You can get online and measure them. So we're lucky in Australia. By world standards, our normal building practices mean we have to consider sustainability initiatives and each venue has different options. I would have liked to have done a lot more. Um, but in our budget, when we were, you know, sort of moving temporary venues into permanent ones, we, we probably didn't achieve as much as we would have liked. But um, when you go to visit the venues, hopefully you'll see some of those practices that are obvious. There's others that you won't see, and that's the building management systems that sit behind the buildings. So the efficiency management um, systems that go in place to control how energy is used. Um, and the practices of um, recycling our waste and having the correct facilities at the back of house to support um, the removal and separation of waste so we're not moving it all off to landfill. Games Village um, set ourselves a target to um, divert 60% of construction waste uh, from landfill. We're actually achieving about a 90 to 92, I don't know what the latest figure is, but about 90% of the construction waste is being recycled. It's not going to landfill. So th there's a range of initiatives. Each project has its own opportunity. Um, I think we could have done more, but um, taking temporary venues to permanent ones probably restricted us from, from doing some of that. Okay, we have a, another question in the front row. Um, there's oh, a microphone coming really for you. A quick one. We've seen the press report that in, in a panic state, the Gold Coast City will fund the NBN services. <laughs> Is that pressure? It looks to me at the present moment, uh, with high, what's called high density streaming, video streaming, we're going to be in an embarrassing situation. We're absolutely an NBN backwater. We're going to be the laughing stock of the world from the point of view of high density streaming. West of the M1, there is no NBN until 2020, literally. So, what's the yeah. plan to um, do anything about NBN? So, um, the, 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 that the was city. That's my question as well. Good question. The city does have a di <laughs> digital strategy, and in fact, there's 23 benefits that the city had identified that sits behind those aspirations. And the last one is we are a digital city. Um, I think there's a bit of. Uh, I think the. No, but that's our aspiration. Um, and importantly, Di needs mm. to carry that message to some of these global companies. But I think there was a bit of misrepresentation in the media about what Council was actually doing. Council's not going out there to replace NBN, so NBN's task is primarily to service residential customers. What we're doing in the light rail project in the, and in the delivery of the health and knowledge precinct is there's a conduit that's been put into light rail stage one and light rail stage two and go into light rail stage three. And that needs to bleed out into key precincts. So 
across the road, there's, there's an NBN service going in and there's a separate conduit where the city will be able to run its own fibre and provide services to all the way along the corridor to support council um, activity. So, you know, measuring data and, and traffic lights and all the new technology that's emerging for the city to make real-time decisions, but also to provide fast and cheap broadband to support the businesses that Di's talking about, because NBN's interest is principally in um, probably the residential customer. Um, but when you look at a map of where how NBN's been rolled out across the country, there's a big hole over the Gold Coast. That's yeah, right. and I'm not. I don't think we can do anything about that before the yeah. for the games, unfortunately. Well, we've only got time for one more question. Um, it's another one down the front, unless there's somebody else. Just the front row here again. Sorry, oh. I'm just making her run. <laughs> She's young. <laughs> She's young and fit. <laughs> I'd like to move from the uh, ethereal to the severely practical. 1982 Commonwealth Games in Brisbane. And there was an absolute dearth of ladies' lose <laughs> against the men's lose. Can we please <laughs> sort of up the proportions because of those who have to sit down and those who don't have to <laughs> sit down? And, can we, and also, secondarily, um, the Kimberbar facility is fairly small. Are we preparing to actually cope with the extra sewage flows? I like practical. Yep. And, and good. it would be incredibly em embarrassing if the game's village, for example, <laughs> the, the network overflowed. So uh, in, uh, we actually had to do some modelling. So we did some um, forecast and load modelling across our infrastructure, um, particularly this, this precinct across the road, because... There's 1,280 apartments in there, but we're stacking 6,500 people in them. So the load on, on the water and sewage network in particular is pushed, you know, right up there. So before we started to put pipes in the ground, we actually went and started to model the impact, um, not just within the network itself, but the impact on our regional infrastructure. So, you know, the pump station up, um, upstream and the, the, the sewage treatment plant... Um, so we're, we're pretty confident that we'll, we'll... We always have issues. Every day we have issues in our network. It's our ability to respond to those, and we're well-practised at that. But there's been a, a lot of modelling, and in some cases, um, um, investment in, in upgrading that infrastructure. So in, in the village, the, the, the biggest sewer pipe in the city carries 60% of the city's waste, runs through that site. And we actually did some, uh, a range of tests on that and, and came to a conclusion that with the, the high level of construction on there and the loads, that there was some risk and no one was prepared to accept that risk in that location. So the project funded the replacement um, of a significant portion of that uh, regional infrastructure. Okay. We will have to finish there. Um, it's been absolutely fascinating from sewerage to aspiration and... Um, swimming pools without roofs, which I personally think is really nice. Um, so I would like you all to join me in thanking our three um, guests tonight. <laughs> it's been wonderful to, to see um, the, the scope of what's happened.